The story of Thor and the Midgarth Serpent is one that many people who like mythology are aware of. It tells of how Thor, a god of the Vikings, goes out to the sea to try and catch a huge serpent that encircles the world. And this type of myth, where a storm god fights a serpent, is told in a number of cultures and places across the Indo-European landscape. However, whilst many people are aware of this story, uh, today I'm not only going to tell the story and some of its analogues, um, we're also going to look at its origins, and in doing so we can try and understand what this really means, and whether this story actually goes back thousands of years. And so, welcome to the story of Thor and the Midgarth Serpent, and welcome to Crickenfold. The Mythgard Serpent, sometimes named Euromangander, is a child of Loki, the trickster god, and was thrown into the sea by Odin. And there the serpent grew so large that it encircled the world, and was eventually able to grasp its own tail. And the myth has it that when it lets go of its tail, then the Ragnarok will begin, and it will be the age of the twilight of the gods. The story of Thor and the Mythgarth Serpent was originally found in a couple of books from Iceland, and probably best known uh, is the version from its appearance in the Poetic Edda, uh, an old Norse manuscript of poetry, and this was written in the middle to late 13th century, probably by the Christian monks in Iceland. Within the Poetic Edda, the poem titled Himir's poem, or the Himiskiva, tells the story of where a huge cauldron must be found to brew beer for all the gods, and it is part of this story that a fishing trip takes place where Thor and a giant called Hymir go out to try and catch food for dinner. But whilst Hymir catches whales, Thor catches the Mythgarth serpent. The fishing trip ends when, in this poem, Thor smashes the serpent on its head with his hammer Mjolnir and it falls back into the sea, its fate unknown. This poem, the Himiskither, actually appears in two different Old Norse manuscripts, in the Codex Regis, uh, the manuscript from which most of the Poetic Edda is formed, and in the manuscript AM 7481 Quarto, although it is not well preserved in either of these, leaving some of the words and sentences unclear, and therefore this would have left scholars a little unsure of what actually happened between Thor and the Mythgar Serpent. But luckily, in the 13th century, a Christian scholar and Icelander, Snorri Sturluson, wrote down a version of this tale in a story called The Gilfanging, part of the book we now call the Prose Edda, a manuscript that is about 50 years older than the Poetic Edda. And so by combining these two manuscript details, we can piece together the story. And that is what I'm going to do now. I'll tell you a standalone version of the story combining the best of the sources I've mentioned, so we can have a basis on which to look at certain details of the myth to try and understand what it really means. Now, if you don't want to hear the tale itself, then feel free to skip using the YouTube chapters below. And so, for the rest of you, here is the tale of Thor and the Jormungandr. Thor had only recently come back from his visit to the giant Utgartha Loki, and was looking for revenge for all the tricks that were played on him, especially the one that involved the Jormungandr. But Thor also had a dislike of the Jotuns, those monstrous beings. He was known as the one who would make Jotuns weep, and he was a Jotun killer. And if anyone was going to get redress on those Jotuns, it was him. And so, for Thor's next adventure, he decided to disguise himself as a young boy. And he left Asgard to go on a journey. And he left behind his chariot, his goats, and any company. And he went to travel across Mithgard. And it wasn't too long before he arrived at the home of the giant Hymir. A giant who had the possession of the most impressive cauldron. So big, it was large enough to brew mead for all the gods. Ymir didn't recognise Thor, due to him being dressed as a boy, and offered him a place to stay overnight as a guest. Ymir's wife had cooked three oxen, and Thor ate two of them, much to Ymir's surprise and, albeit, anger. But Thor was a guest, and there is a certain etiquette one must maintain with guests, and the hospitality of them. And so Ymir said nothing, and after Thor had finished eating, he went to bed. Just before dawn, Hymir awoke, dressed, and was on his way to his small whaleboat to go sea-fishing for more food. 
Thor had woken early to listen out for Hymir, and on hearing him get up, Thor arose himself and ensured he was walking with him as he left to go to the boat. Thor asked Hymir if he could go out to sea with him, but Hymir wasn't keen, saying that Thor was just a boy and so would not be of use on such a trip, and that he would get cold if he were out to sea so long as Hymir was. This made Thor angry, and he wanted to smash Hymir's head with his hammer, but instead he conserved his strength and convinced Hymir to take him, saying that he would not be the first to ask to row back. He then asked Hymir what he could use as bait for fishing, and Hymir told him to get his own bait. And so Thor went into the forest where Hymir's cattle were, and he found the biggest ox called Himinrat, and he tore off the ox's head. Thor proceeded to take the ox's head with him down to the boat on the sea, and on seeing this, Hymir wasn't impressed, and angrily told Thor to row the boat out to sea. Emir was somewhat taken aback about how well the boy rowed, with so much energy, but he still did not see through Thor's disguise. Thor's rowing moved the boat quickly and passed where Emir usually fished to catch flatfish. He asked Thor to stop, but Thor kept rowing, saying he wanted to go out much further, into the deepest sea, and Emir told Thor to stop once again, for he feared the Mithgard serpent swam in the waters they were now close to. Thor rowed for a little more before eventually stopping the boat, and this made Hymir very unhappy. But there the boat lay on the sea, and so fishing could commence. Thor placed the oars in the boat and set up his fishing line. It was a strong line with a strong large hook, and upon this hook he fastened the ox's head, before casting the line over the side of the boat. He watched the ox's head sink into the sea, and eventually felt the line slack as the head hit the bottom of the sea. Hymir too cast out a line, and soon caught two whales on one hook, enough to feed everyone later, he thought. But the trickery that was played on Thor, fooling him into thinking he was lifting a cat at Tuthgarth Loki, when in fact he was lifting the Mithgarth serpent that itself was disguised, well, that trickery was about to be repaid, as he looked to catch the Jornungander. The serpent was slowly swimming along the bottom of the sea, and it smelt the blood of the ox's head. It stretched its mouth around that ox's head, biting down hard onto it, and in doing so, he also bit down onto the hook of Thor's line. Immediately the serpent felt the hook pierce its mouth, and it yanked backwards, pulling the line hard and fast, and Thor, who was holding the other end, Thor felt the line pull so hard, it pulled his fist down, crashing on the sides of the boat. Thor had to counter this, and so he pushed down with his feet so hard, they went through the floor of the boat, and he braced them against the bottom of the sea. And then, with all his strength, he pulled the line hard, pulling up the Mythgarth serpent out of the sea and into the boat. What happened next is often considered by some to be the most frightening sight in history, and no one can know such a frightening sight if they were not there when Thor and the Mythgarth serpent stared at each other. The serpent spit in poison as Thor looked at him with so much anger. It's also said that Hymir changed colour, turning pale in fright at the sight of the serpent. The sea swelling overboard, the serpent screaming and wailing, volcanoes started to erupt, and the earth quaked, and Hymir panicked. And a store grabbed his hammer, lifting it into the air to strike a fatal blow to the Jormungandr. Hymir cut Thor's line, with his fish knife, releasing the serpent back into the sea. The serpent swam down, down towards the bottom of the sea, but Thor had not given up hope of killing the Romagenda, and threw his hammer down into the sea after the serpent. Some say his hammer struck the head of the serpent, perhaps killing it, perhaps crushing its head. But others say the serpent is still alive, encircling the seas and oceans. But as the sea calmed, Ymir sat pale-faced, wondering what had happened. Thor looked at Ymir. He could not hold back any more. 
angry at Ymir for cutting the line, Thor swung his fist at Ymir's ear. The giant flew overboard and the soles of his feet showed in the sea. And with this Thor waded back to shore, then went to Ymir's home and took the cauldron. But on doing so, he was chased by a many-headed army of Jotun. However, with Mjolnir by Thor's side, he soon put those chasing him to the hammer, and the army lay dead, leaving Thor to carry on with his adventures. And this story has many elements, and we can summarise the plot as a storm god or a warrior god, as Thor can represent both, uh, along with a companion here in the guise of a Jotun, consuming a large amount of meat, having an ox head as bait, battling the serpent before battling many Jotun and returning home. And so let's go through this plot to see what these actions actually mean and whether there are actually deeper reasons for those elements that make up the story. But the first thing I'd like to do before we look further into this story is to be sure there is a story that was told by those who were considered part of the old Norse culture. By that I mean, can we be sure that this story is an authentic piece of Norse mythology? And the reason I say this is that at the beginning of the story, there is a reference to another tale called Uthgard Loki. And this tale is well known as it shows Thor failing at challenges. And this tale is found in the Prose Edda written by Snorri Sturluson. Now the Prose Edda, whilst an important source of information around old Norse mythology, it can't be considered 100% reliable as a source of Old Norse mythology. And this is because Snorri Sturluson, being a Christian scholar, was not only recording the mythology of the Icelanders, but his stories were encompassing a Christian bias, as he aimed to ensure Icelanders were converted to Christianity. And as such, there may be passages and stories in the Prose Edda that were created or rewritten by Snorri to act as a conversion tool. And the tale of Utgartha Loki is now often seen by academics as a story composed by Snorri to aid Christian conversions. The story may itself be a reflex of a tale that is an authentic piece of Old Norse mythology, you know, one that is now lost to history, but is now shaped to show how an Old Norse god can be deceived like a human and can fail like a human. And something that an authentic Old Norse mythological story would never suggest. Now, I can talk about Uthgarth Loki's story specifically in another video if you're interested, just let me know in the comments. But for now, we need to ask ourselves, can a story that mentions Uthgarth Loki be a genuine story? Well, even though Uthgarth Loki plants the seeds of motive for this story. The fact that there are actually two versions of the story of Thor fishing, one in the Prose Edda, one in Poetic Edda, and that the plot of Uthgarth and Loki is not critically integral to the story of Thor and the serpent, then we can feel far more confident about its authenticity and infer that the story was probably told by the people of pre-Christian Old Norse cultures. And knowing this, we can then ask, how well was the story known? Now, this may help us understand the story's importance and how much it meant to the culture. Well, apart from the telling of the story by Snorri in the Prose Edda and within the two other manuscripts, the tale also appears on picture stones. And these are stones with carvings on that show representations of Old Norse stories. Uh, the most well-known one of these regards to the story of Thor and the serpent is the Gosforth picture stone near Newcastle in northeast England. And this clearly shows the use of an ox's head for bait. But there are other stones such as the Hurradum stone, whose picture I'll show here. This isn't so clear, but it shows that multiple picture stones of this story were made. And the other known picture stone is that of the Ultina stone, which clearly shows Thor putting his feet through the bottom of the boat and that a serpent has multiple heads. And seeing these pictures and knowing the rune stones were made between the 9th and the 11th centuries allows us to infer that the story of Thor and the serpent is probably at least 1200 years old and what is written is probably an accurate reflection of the story being orally told at that time. So now we have evidence to show this was an important and well-known myth 
Our next path is to look down to see if this story is told elsewhere. And by doing so, this will allow us to understand if there is an older, more original source of this story. And here we can find two obvious comparisons, one in Egyptian mythology and the other in the Vedic culture. And in the Vedic culture of India, in hymn 18 of Mandala 4, there is an account of the battle between Indra and the Ritra. Uh, and for this video, I've written an abridged and contemporized version of this, which I'll read for you now. Uh, and you may be somewhat familiar with the characters in the myth if you watch my video on Trito, the first Proto-Indo-European warrior, and which I'll link here. Uh, but as for the story, a summary of it is as follows. In Tavasta's dwelling, Indra drank the summer. A hundred worth of juice pressed from the mortar. What is his destiny? He who his mother carried for a thousand months over many autumns. There's been no one like him before, nor no one like him will come again. Hidden by his mother for fearing him a disappointment, Indra was endowed with all heroic valour. Then up he rose, dressed himself and filled the earth and heaven. The holy ones all shouted together, Waters flowed and river banks burst as the raging river smashed against rocks. But what did this mean? Were the floods a message welcoming Indra, or were they taking his shame? And then, with his great thunderbolt, Indra slaughtered Richer, and this allowed these rivers to be free to wander. Indra rose up with the strength to conquer, breaking the jaws of Richer into pieces, crushing the serpent's head. The cow had brought forth the strong, mighty and unconquerable bull. The furious Indra. His mother had left her newborn calf to wander, seeking himself the path that he would follow. Then Indra's mother spoke to him, saying that all the gods had forsaken him. And Indra replied, as he was about to slaughter Vritra, O oh my friend Vritra, come here to me, you who made my mother a widow. What god was on hand to comfort her? In deep sadness I was left to eat dog's intestines, and amongst those gods I found no comfort, and felt like I was falling apart, until, that is, the falcon brought me the pleasant summer. Here we see Indra, who tells us that Vritra killed his father, was given Soma, part of a ritual of strength, before fighting and slaying the serpent. But within the middle of the story there is an analogy of the cow and cattle. This therefore seems as though it is a story that comes from the same source as the tale of Thor and the Mythgard serpent, but a story probably told up to 2000 years earlier. And then Within Egyptian mythology, we have a story contained within one of the most well-known books been derived from this period and region, and that is from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. In there, I'll read a passage based on a translation by R.A. Swaller, and I've given this short translation a more contemporary feel, and it reads as follows. At about noon, the bark, and the bark is a kind of boat, so the bark of Ri Holakathi reaches the summit of a mountain where the serpent Apophis is found, and whose head is made of silix. This serpent swallows in one gulp part of the stream. Set at the front of the boat, directs his lance of iron and fire against him, and causes him to cough up all that he has swallowed. And there are a number of passages about this found in Egyptian history, as well as a number of examples of iconography, such as these images showing Set, often a figure with a wolf's head. Uh, now, as an aside, some people say these heads represent jackal's heads, but we know through DNA analysis of the canines in Egypt at this time uh, that these clearly show that Egyptians had canines that were based on wolves' DNA and not jackals. But anyway, Set here um, is on a boat killing the serpent Apophis, who is sometimes called Apep. And this is definitely a water-based serpent killing myth. Although here there is a lack of cow or a lack of cattle motif. So between 
the old Norse, the Egyptian and uh, India, we have three stories of storm gods who kill a serpent at the waters. And these stories share a number of similar moments within them. And if we look around further, we see other examples of mythology. But we also need to be aware that not all God versus Dragon stories can be linked to this one. For example, some people say that Marduk and Tiamat battle within the Enuma Elish. Uh, the Sumerian mythology is an example of a God versus a water serpent. But as shown in the Enuma Elish video I made a little while ago, uh, Marduk, the sky god, um, he, rather than a specific storm god, although he does have some of that power with control of the wind, um, he was fighting Tiamat, who is actually a cow uh, in her primitive form, and keeping the theme of oxen from the old Norse story. But this is fundamentally a creation myth, a, a battle that creates creation from chaos. However, we do have reconstructions of Baltic myths in Peron and Veles, uh, which could infer a similar myth. We have Zeus slaying the half-man, half-sea creature Typhon in Greek mythology. And then there is a Hittite version of the myth noted in uh, Manuel uh, LaRoche's uh, mythical texts of the Hittites. Um, although there are a significant number of scholars who don't necessarily think that is a fit. Um, and I'll put references to all these down below in the description if you want to read books about these or papers. So we do have to be careful in consideration of where these myths sit so as to separate them from creation myths or from other mythological plots. But for us, the water serpent battling the storm god with cattle um, is a reflex of the original myth from the first Proto-Indo-European warrior, Trito, and the cattle raiding myths that came from this. And to summarise the cattle raiding myth, um, it basically goes that the sky god created cattle and gave the cattle to man. The aboriginals of the local area take the cattle away. And man, in the form of the warrior Trito, asks the gods for strength through a ritual. And he then goes off to kill the aborigines, rescue the cattle, and then sacrifices the cattle back to the god in thanks. And so there's this circle of mythology. And over time, uh, the aboriginals became a three-headed dragon, possibly as a reference to the Indo-Mediterranean's worship to a three-faced god, something Indo-Europeans didn't have in their pantheon. And so in effect, Trito, the warrior, is facing the god of the enemies, and over time, the cows turn into women in the shape of queens or princesses. So, knowing all this, where does this leave us in terms of Thor and the Mythgard serpent? Well, if we go back to the story, we see at the start of the tale, no cattle have been stolen. But Thor has been tricked by uh, the Mythgard serpent, that Uthgarth Loki, an underhand action that needs revenge. And so he feasts to gain his strength. And that brings cattle into the plot, showing through eating them. And then getting the head of an ox as bait also infers cattle. But Thor, a god, cannot sacrifice to himself. And so he appears as a boy, a character who feasts. In effect, the mortal of the story and the god of the story are one and the same. He then travels to the land of the Aboriginals by rowing into the deep sea. So, in effect, rowing out further out than Himir wanted into foreign waters, it shows a transposition from a friendly place to a place of the enemy. And here, the head of the ox now represents the cattle, in effect reinforcing the taking of the cattle as the serpent bites, taking the bait. He so takes the cattle. And this starts the fight where Thor then hurls Molnir at the serpent. And whilst the serpent in the story may not be three-headed, which is often the case uh, in descriptions of the other old myths around Trito, in the picture form of the Atluna um, stone, it shows a multi-headed serpent. Now, this raises interesting questions about whether the Yolomangand was therefore a direct reflex of the dragon of the Trito myths. However, we also see in the Trito video that there is iconography from Germanic tribes that doesn't necessarily support this. And then there is a the detail 
uh, in the stories but that they don't say whether the Thor retrieved the bait, which would have been reflective on retrieving the kettle. But perhaps this detail is not important for the overall story in the Old Norse perspective. What is clear is that when breaking down the story of Thor and the Mythgar serpent, we see that it is a reflex of the cattle raiding myth. It is a story that has derived from that older myth and has changed to suit the culture and environment. And we can show this more clearly if we compare it directly with the Pi myth and the Vedic myth. In the Pi myth, the hero is Trito, the Vedic Trita, and in the Norse it is Himir as Thor's companion. The Pi deity of Inir is the Vedic Indra and the Old Norse Thor. The enemy, which is the Vedic Visvarupa, or whom we also call Vitra, is the Mythgarth the serpent, and the ritual is the drinking of Soma in the Rig Veda, but within the poem there is a meal of much meat. The three-headed serpent of the Pine Vedic uh, becomes a single-headed Mythgarth the serpent, but there is also an example of iconography showing four heads. The Aborigine, who is in Vedic, is called the Dasa, is now in the deep sea, or what we consider uh, the ends of the earth. And the encounter with cattle happens when the serpent takes the ox's head. And the booty, the prize, is not the cattle in our norse, but the ox's head. And the table up up shows the correspondence between the old Norse Vedic and Pi very clearly. But what this doesn't tell us is why a water serpent. We see the myth of Trito moving from cattle raiding enemies to rescuing princesses from dragons, but why has water become part of the myth? And this is in India, Egypt and Scandinavia, to name but a few places. And to me, this is reflective of the importance of farming, as much as the importance of cattle. Without fresh water, you could not plant crops. You could not offer drinking water to cattle. You could not survive as a people. Water was important. It controlled trade routes via rivers and seaports and farming and general health, especially spring water. And I think it is this that added the element of water to the myth. As it grew and became more popular, so the dragon not only stole cattle, but owned land that had water resources, farming resources, trade resources. And these were important lands required by the Indo-Europeans. And so the cattle raiding myth splits into two derivatives, one of rescuing princesses, but the other turns into more into a take control of water and in effect control of the sea, the seaports, the springs, uh, irrigation farmland as well as the cattle. The water myth, I feel, emphasises the growth and expansion of Indo-Europeans and farming in the Bronze Age and beyond, a natural development of the myth of Trito. And so, in conclusion, Thor and the Mythgartha serpent is a derivative of the cattle raiding myth of Trito, with Thor representing the warrior a position he upheld within the pantheon of the Old Norse. And the story was reflective of the power the Old Norse had in gaining lands. And so, I hope you enjoyed that journey, found it interesting and useful. As I say, I've written references in the description of the video, and I'll answer as many questions as I can you put in the comments. Um, please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. It means a lot, it helps others see the videos, it costs you nothing to do, uh, and makes me happy. And until the next video, please stay safe and stay well. And this was Crackenford.